Hi everyone, it's a thrill to be back. I was here a couple years ago when I was talking about different neurotransmitters, oxytocin, and dopamine, and serotonin, and a few others. Um, and when I was speaking to uh, about uh, you know what I could uh, speak about, I, I gave him a number of things, but he said, okay, just go for dopamine. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about. Now, <laughs> to start off, I have something wonderful inside of this box. And what's in here will boost your dopamine levels guaranteed. <laughs> so I'm gonna put this uh, just out here. And um, Michael and me, we coordinated beforehand. So uh, Michael's gonna be scanning for evidence of dopaminergic activity manifest through uh, members of the audience. So he'll be doing like studies and at the end, Michael will come and say, who has expressed the most dopamine? In, you know, through behavioral encoding, very much similar to what the TSA uses, but we're just <laughs> scanning for <laughs> dopamine there. So um, let me just start off uh, with a bit of the mythology that uh, goes around. And uh, I think, Tammy, you were, you're, you're polite on the media. I, I have no problem completely trashing them for spreading rampant misinformation on an epic scale and bloggers who just like invent stuff. So. Uh, <laughs> You probably hear that dopamine is a pleasure or a happiness neurotransmitter. Um, variable reward schedules are so powerful, they can turn anyone into like a drug addict, even you know, a healthy average citizen. Um, and that Facebook specifically is coming up, and I've, I've been asked to speak to a number of journalists about, you know, and they always pitch this thing, oh yeah, Facebook's trying to you, you know, intentionally manipulate people with dopamine. And they, they want me to buy into this. They're really pushing this, and they're looking for people who endorse their point of view. So, if these claims were actually true, uh, social media would be pure ecstasy, right? Like, oh, this, uh, oh, I'm on Facebook, I'm getting all this dopamine. Oh yeah, use more of those techniques on me, because they, they work so well, I, I'm so high, I've lost all control. Um, we would all be addicts, we would be uh, manipulated. No one would have any impulse control. Uh, technically, I know there's a debate on things like in internet addiction and different addiction. So, so technically, your target audience, you, <laughs> you, you wouldn't find them in a book on marketing, but the DSM-5 for uh, <laughs> mental health disorders. And of course, everyone would be using it, so it wouldn't work, because, you know everyone else is using. So uh, just a, a bit about reality. So, so dopamine does, uh, it makes people you know, feel good, it energizes people, it does pick them up, it is a reward, you know, transmitter. Um, but that effect, it, it leaves fast, so it, you know, it's not long lasting. Um, people also habituate, so something that was rewarding, pe people get bored of things after a while. You know, the same rewards, they, they don't last forever. Um, it does play a role in reinforcement, so in, in uh, uh, con uh, classic conditioning and reinforcement learning, so it helps people to learn things. Uh, but it doesn't entirely explain what's going on, and the reason is because the media is so obsessed with the conspiracy theories and hype about dopamine addicting that they forgot to mention we humans have a braking system. So there are other factors that stop us uh, from doing things. Um, there are many diseases associated with dopamine. Uh, with uh, my company, uh, I started focusing on um, neuroscience and the role of personality in predicting behavior, and I, I develop uh, psychometric predictive models to you know, make assumptions about what strategies work uh, best and worst with people based on their personality. Um, but diseases are very insightful into what's happening with the average person. So, so too little dopamine uh, is associated with like, motor impairments and diseases like uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, too much dopamine is associated with like mania and extreme cases. Uh, there, you know, some links to schizophrenia. And so, you know, we all operate at normal healthy levels. Now, dopamine also changes people's personality. So, um, uh, it can make you more politically liberal if as a child you were exposed to a very broad social network. Uh, it makes people a little more adventurous. Uh, it's great for creativity because it means things, schema violations don't bother you, so you're a little bit more open-minded overall. So um, that's just a quick intro. So today, this is what I'm going to go through fairly quickly. I'm going to talk about motivation and dopamine, um, something we call approach behavior, so how we anticipate things. 
Um, I'm going to also give you a model of dopamine, which is uh, a, a little bit more accurate. I'll talk about how we overcome habituation or marketing fatigue. Um, we'll deal with uh, disappointment because we should never use clickbait and let people down, and everything we promise we should deliver on it. And uh, you know, we all know stories uh, from our childhood about this, but I'll show you the dopamine curves. Anyways, I'll just summarize the key points, and then after, a uh, massive, <laughs> massive reward. Very big. <laughs> So talk about motivation. So I am obsessed with this image. In fact, it kicked off um, like five to six years of R&D. And I used to not teach people about uh, motivation. So uh, you know, my, my gig, I'm sort of like a gypsy scientist. And I go from city to city, and I travel around, and I teach people how to use behavioral psychology for interactive design and marketing. And I used to not teach motivation. And the reason was, I actually didn't know what motivated people. I just knew as a behavioral scientist. OK, uh, look it up in randomized control trials, and, and then you can figure out what works. So um, this model got me interested, because what it was is it was the first time neurobiologists said, well, let's take a look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs based on what we know about what motivates mammals in general and humans, because we just happen to be mammals. And we happen to share a lot of the same motivational structures. And so I'm going to quickly talk you up this. And when I talk about the things on this side, I'm going to talk about loss aversion techniques, uh, where you're promising uh, something you know, bad will come out of a situation, versus incentives, where you're promising something good will come out of an offer that you make to someone. And at the bottom, we have physiological homeostasis. So people are motivated to feel a sense of you know, physical well-being. And basically, uh, you know, try, try not going to the washroom for a day, and you'll know what homeostasis feels like to resist it. So your body is going to start shifting your behavior, and, uh, and if you don't act on these, um, that's what we call pressure. That's like literally pressure. There's no better <laughs> metaphor of what a pressure technique than is <laughs> hold your bladder. Uh, safety and security, so these are motivators about getting away from threats. Down here, the motivation is about removing a, a danger. Uh, there's, there's no positive side, because once the threat's eliminated, uh, once the pressure's gone, we're, we're back normal. Uh, we have a lot of, there's a whole area of like, social emotions we have, where we have a desire to connect with people, we feel bonds of trust, we feel rewarded, we are social, it's hardwired into us, and we don't like to be rejected, we don't like to be ostracized, we don't like to have relationships that break up, uh, we don't like to have to deal with outsiders of our in-group, uh, status and self-esteem. We are motivated to uh, climb our social hierarchies. We want to have a sense of pride, uh, feel proud of ourselves, and shame and uh, emotions of depression are not wonderful. Uh, sex was sort of left out of Maslow's hierarchy of sort of a bit of a, like you can't take a motivational theory that doesn't have sex in it, seriously. <laughs> because it's a core motivator. Uh, love is a core motivator of humans, and parenting. And uh, everything at the top is what we call reproduction motivational structure. So uh, when we talk about dopamine, we talk about any anticipation or reward. So whenever you promise someone, you know, we'll, we'll help you, uh, you know, build the life you want to build. We'll help you, you know, connect with people. And, you know, we go into the, like, the dating technology. They all have their different appeals up there. So dopamine is what we're talking about. So it's a neurotransmitter that plays a role in motivation, and it's triggered on anticipation of reward. Uh, it uh, fires up what we call approach behavior, so it gets people to move towards action, and it plays a role not just in the motivational structures, but in also the motor activation, which is why um, it's implicit in uh, motor uh, impairments from diseases like Parkinson's. Um, cortisol is a hormone, it's not a neurotransmitter, and it's part of the stress response. And normally it, it accents things, so uh, it, get, it wakes us up and it gets us to deal with threats. Um, serotonin is what I want to talk a little bit more about. So, so it actually moderates, it's, it's not as well understood, so, it, so there's more sort of complex relations. Um, but it actually strengthens people's goal attainment work. Um, it, uh, it stops people from acting impulsively. It gets them to put on the brakes and think through things. 
Um, but it also deactivates uh, motor systems, gets people to stop doing action. So quite often we'll talk about serotonin a bit more as like the braking system. And when you hear about something uh, firing up dopamine, uh, normally it doesn't mean there's like actually more dopamine. It just means that there's neural circuits that are tied to motivational structures that are firing. And when we talk about things like more dopamine, normally that's not what's happening because uh, it gets down to looking at uh, synapses and explaining, well, why, why is a synapse, um, you know, uh, bridging the electromagnetic, or sorry, the, the electrochemical uh, circuitry of a neuron, why is it going faster? And we could get into a few more explanations, but I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this, because uh, I want to mainly talk about the braking system. So, uh, one of the big theories is that, yes, dopamine does play a role in driving behavior, but serotonin also plays a role in stopping it. And the conspiracy theories about Facebook are absolutely ridiculous, because who would talk about a car uh, uh, in terms of driving without also talking about the braking system? Um, the models that were given by the media on how Facebook gets high levels of engagement only apply to people with extreme addictions. And it's just because they're, they're I don't even know where these people get their information from. They uh, source like pop psychology, and they, and they do, like I've had people approach me from the media. It's like they, they want me to endorse their conspiracy theories. And it's, I, I don't really know anything that would endorse their perspective. So I'm gonna go to dopamine, but just always remember it's part of a larger system, um, and we have wisdom. We have mechanisms for stopping action. And when it comes to conversion design, uh, we, we always have to keep this in mind. And I'll show you that actually the more accurate models of how dopamine operate will, will give you a good understanding of like how no matter what we do, um, at the end of the day, we're all gonna have to be honest, straightforward, and have like a credible source behind everything we do. And there's not really much uh, beyond that. But the dopamine, uh, by having a more detailed understanding, will help us um, explain things a little better. So uh, let's look at anticipation. So here's a question. How do we trigger our audience's dopamine? So. One thing we could do is we can ask a question. We can present anything that someone might be interested in. Um, I could, is anyone interested? Should I open it now? Who wants, does anyone know? Okay. So literally like asking questions, anytime you get somebody interested in someone, we're starting to get that curiosity. So. Um, who here has or has had a cat or a dog? Any? Okay, so what happens when you start opening a can of cat food or start crinkling that paper, right? What, what does your animal do? It's like beeline right into the kitchen, right? It knows something's up. And that's that curiosity. And it's like, what's that crinkly stuff? I know. <laughs> I know what that crinkly stuff is. That's probably food. And so that's exactly what happens when we're triggering dopamine. It's that curiosity, and then the approach is where you're walking towards it. So here's an example of a vast playing on this. And uh, they came down for some of my training, uh, and they told me that this does very well, but the first time. Um, and so what does this say? It says it's a welcome gift. Your welcome gift from a vast is ready. Unpack it. So, so actually, you don't know what it is. So it's like hinting at something that's of value. And, you don't, and, and so this can be very uh, arousing. It wakes people up because dopamine sort of energizes and it starts activating that approach behavior. Uh, get rich quick schemes, they've been motivating for a long time. Uh, money is a good motivator because you can cash it in for many things. Uh, <laughs> in the pyramid I showed you and other motivational systems. Um, there's actually two major motivators here I wanna talk about, so mystery boxes. Um, does anyone have blind box subscription here? Anyone, anyone go for it? Has anyone tried them before? So they were pretty popular for a while. Uh, so, so different online uh, you know, tools and products and services where there's like an uncertainty component, but also auctions themselves operate uh, on the same mechanisms. So they're also considered dopamine triggers. Um, I was using uh, a PC cleaner, and I, this one just popped up. I thought it was a great example. So 
they have this sort of like game and then you, you know, this thing flashes around and it lands on one of these and it's your sort of like uh, uh, slot machine discount savings. And so it lands on one of these savings and then, and then what they do is they, they get you to play it and then they put you to either loss aversion or incentive. So, <laughs> So on one side, they play off the loss aversion. If you turn it down, you're going to lose a deal. And the other is they push you towards the incentive. So they, that was sort of a fun way to play on it. Um, what these child stars look like today. Does anyone click on those articles that say, I'll bet you can't believe what Britney Spears looks like today? Or, no, I do. <laughs> those like outbrain tabula ads. They're, a lot of the, um, them, because they're done through like optimization, the things that come to the surface are a lot of like sort of clickbaity, I'll bet you can't believe, and, and these 10 like wonderful facts that you didn't know existed and whatever, and that, that sort of stuff. And so those are all hardcore like anticipation of like, you know, answering some area of curiosity. Of course, BuzzFeed, like who doesn't want to know what uh, dog breed you are? <laughs> like, you know, like, BuzzFeed surveys are wonderful. <laughs> so um, this is a very important model. So I'm going to walk through it a couple of times. So um, when you think about dopamine, the, the simple um, spikes of dopamine um, that you sometimes hear about, like you do the thing and you get your, your reward. So like I said, it's not an actual spike. It's just uh, activating circuitry generally, and this is actually the underlying mechanism that explains it. So this is important, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through examples, because, uh, and if you don't follow this, uh, you might want to get my slides and go through this, because th this is an extremely important model for explaining how it works. And it's one of the more current theories about what's happening. So uh, we have up here a uh, user prediction, and here. Um, so that's, that's where someone sees something, and say uh, someone comes to an opt-in page, and there's some like ebook. As, as like, you know, the thing incentivizing them to take action. And they, they know the company a bit, and they're like, you know, they, they produce pretty decent stuff. You know, they download whatever the opt-in content is. And they thought that it was going to be OK. And they get it. And it's like, you know what? That, that, was, that was OK. It was not bad. You know, they write good content. And the next time, you know, they encounter something from the company, they'll say, oh, yeah, the last one's pretty good. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Why not? Um, and that's what happens when you have, you know, some decent relationship. Now, what happens if you go for an opt-in and it's really a piece of lousy <laughs> nonsense, like really low grade, it's all hype, it's clickbaity stuff, they wanted your email and they didn't even bother to, you know, put in the effort uh, to write something of any quality. So, so we have an error, so that means the person says, you know what, that, that's not correct. I got this and it was really underwhelming. So I'm going to update my prediction. And now what happens next time you see them? You're like, oh, OK. So actually, what happens is you have a less dopamine spike because you've disappointed someone. But here's something else that happens. Say you go through and you downloaded it, and it was actually way more than you expected. So they really over exceeded your expectations. Now you correct that. And next time you see them, you'll be even more excited. And so the idea is that we adapt. And so that's. Uh, this is now a newer uh, perspective. So here's an example. So imagine we have any situation with dopamine you know, release or triggering the circuitry. There's some trigger event, so someone sees something happening, they act towards it, and then they get the reward. So if you sort of went through something and you didn't really expect too much, then what happens is after the reward, you're, you're pleasantly surprised. Now, after that, this is what happens next. Next time you encounter it, you get a greater spike at the beginning and a smaller one down the line. Oh, and if, uh, sorry, I didn't put on the citations, but this comes from uh, Robert Sapolsky's uh, uh, work, if anyone's wondering the uh, sources here. So does anyone have any children who watch unpacking videos? <laughs> yes? <laughs> does, <laughs> does it mind boggle anyone in here? I know, these things are incredibly addictive. And so if you don't know an unpacking video, so we don't have time, but there are literally videos of people unpacking, like in this case, um, Easter egg surprises. I think they're illegal in America because kids could, um, like you can't put toys in chocolate, it's dangerous. But uh, on YouTube, they're very popular. Um, and, and these things get uh, like, 
These, these videos get views the size of America. The traffic and parents <laughs> say that they can't even take their kids off to the point where they have to actually stop them from doing, watching these things. They're that engaging. So um, we adults have unboxing videos, <laughs> which is the equivalent for us. And remember in the old days of product reviews, it was starting at the phone? They don't do that anymore. They start at the box and stuff. And so I'm, I, 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 I haven't done much video. I started getting into it. Now I'm more likely to like, I'll say, hey, what is this? Let's take a look. And you know, it's something you thought was from kids' shows, right? Because like, early kids' shows used to do that. But it's, it's good for adults as well. So how do we use these uh, in digital marketing and optimization? Um, here are a couple of different techniques. So anytime we have visual hints of different gifts or reward, and we're suggesting what someone might get, uh, we're playing off of it. Mystery prizes. Um, they, they can sort of work, they're a little gimmicky. Um, editorial hooks, uh, that's, this is what an editorial hook is, it's, it's a dopamine trigger. Uh, a value proposition is literally that. It says you're going to get something of value. Um, any benefit statements are like that, their benefits are just not as formulaic, and any hints of rewards, and let's look at how this works in progressive patterns. So normally if you have a good um, content strategy, and what I find a very good writer can do is they know how to get people engaged. You know, and um, what do they say? If it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. So they have something to hook people in. And that hook at, at the beginning, um, that arouses someone's interest. There's something of value that they care about that pulls them in. And if you can raise a question or curiosity right away, we might get them in uh, uh, for more, and then uh, we have to have different techniques to trigger it. Um, for video, you might have five seconds to get someone hooked, and if you do, they're gonna be with you, and then you have to sort of keep them going and going a little longer. Landing page, same thing, might be the value prop, we have some benefits. People have to see clues that they're gonna get something of value, and then they'll sort of keep going on. Uh, my grandfather used to use this one on me as a kid. He was, my grandfather was the Kasparov of checkers. <laughs> And I would play checkers with him, right? And he would always, he would normally let me win, but he knew the optimal ratio to keep me engaged. And if he massacred me, like I would, ah, I'm not playing with grandpa. He's like, <laughs> so he would, but he would lose, and, but he could never resist. Like if he could get like eight of my pieces at once, he would, he would do it. But otherwise he would normally let me win. So he, you know, it's that right level. And the dopamine's a little bit similar. So people have to see the outcome and, uh, we're taking them there slowly, and um, this is the core of all sorts of work we do. I'm also a musician. I use these techniques in composition now as well. It has all sorts of applications and things that we do. Uh, these are some ads that I use in uh, my, my company, and I, I'm just pulling these out because these were actually top performers, so I'll, I'll share them. So can you spot the fake smile? Um, and this one, um, it engages people so much I had to actually turn it down or I don't know, I put it into like separate ads, but normally asking questions, getting people engaged, um, and, and then they'll take a look if, if they're interested. So. Um, so let's talk about how we overcome habituation. And so habituation is where dopamine rewards no longer motivate, and this is a very bad thing because you can't engage people. They're no longer interested. So Voltaire said that the secret of being a bore is to tell everything. So. <laughs> Voltaire was onto something. And so with habituation, things that were once rewarding to someone are no longer motivating. You know, it's like, I don't know, if you have like pizza every night, you're like, oh boy, more pizza. And in marketing and advertising, we have different names for this. So in marketing, you call it marketing fatigue, and in advertising, um, there's banner blindness, and the idea is that uh, people stop seeing value and they disengage. And I talked about serotonin. I don't know if serotonin is implicated here, but I suspect, it's my, my theory, that it plays a role in learning uh, what is fruitless and doesn't, you know, give results. And it's sort of a, it causes a calm avoidance of things. So, and that's where people just tune it out. It's sort of like, I don't know if anyone's gotten an IRS scam here. Uh, in Canada, we have, are these like tax scams, or, right? Like now you're like, someone calls you, you haven't paid your tax, you're sending the police, you're like, yeah, whatever. Okay, <laughs> you're like, right? But for a while, they're working, right? Because you have that experience, and so you tune it out. And most of what we do will fade. Everything fades away. 
Oh, and uh, Tammy, you were talking about like long-term impacts. I, I did a statistical meta-analysis in my doctorate, and most of the psychological effects fade very fast, in fact. They, they drop down, they have like steep attrition curves, and almost no company will ever uh, report this information because it's humiliating, and, and it causes a reverse social norm, so they don't like to share it. So anyways, how can we overcome habituation? So offer more, better, bigger. Uh, so the size of rewards increases dopamine, as does the time to the reward. But just a warning on this side, be careful, because that's dangerous. Like if you have to offer more, eventually what you're doing will become not profitable and you'll be in trouble. So uh, it works, but, but use that one with a lot of caution, because it, it's, it's a very dangerous path to go down. Uh, so next, you know, you could include novelty, surprises, holding back everything. Um, don't overdo your marketing, because remember, you're, you're habituating your audience. So all, I only put my foot on the gas as much as I need it, because otherwise you have to then come up with new creative, right? And so, you know, I spend my resources only to the point that I need to for marketing. Uh, random gifts can sometimes help. Repackaging is a, it's a quick, quick fix, but sometimes you don't, you know, you're in a corner and you have to do it. Innovation and of course, variable rewards can help. The reality is that for variable rewards, uh, most people actually don't have anything that's rewarding that they can give out on a variable reward schedule. So yeah, the technique works, but few, few people actually have a reward that motivates, uh, which renders them uh, very hard to implement. So uh, I'll talk quickly about uncertainty. So we have two types of uncertainty. So when someone's anticipating something, there's the positive and the negative uncertainty. So uh, with uh, positive uncertainty, uh, someone sees an opportunity that could lead to a reward, um, and this is very motivating, or a threat that can lead to a punishment. And the positive side uh, can be very engaging, whereas the negative side um, is extremely stress-inducing and actually has been used to induce nervous breakdowns and is used in torture techniques. I, I'm not, that's not a joke, that's actually what it's done. It induces learned helplessness. And so the randomness with rewards is extremely uh, dopamine uh, releasing, and then the randomness with punishments is extremely stress inducing. And, and so they take uh, different emotions and they accent them to the extreme. And so uh, when you have the reward schedules at 50%, what happens is you get a dopamine spike uh, as there's progress towards the outcome. And that's where we get design patterns, like having uh, different types of prizes and content and different things. So people are like, you know, moving around and sometimes they find something of value and sometimes not. So, um, do I have time for three more slides? Oh, okay. So, um, lastly, I'm gonna talk about progress towards goals. And so what happens to a mouse is dopamine level when it's in a maze moving towards uh, food that it knows exists. So this is what happens. Um, as it's moving towards the outcome, in fact, its dopamine levels are increasing. So, um, uh, okay, pet owners, uh, this is more for dogs. Uh, I, I, this does not work with cats at all. But has anyone taken their dog to the dog park or you're driving it to a beach or something that it likes to go and it almost starts shaking? <laughs> Or it's like getting intense as it gets closer to that dog park or that place or, you know, or you, you might even know that yourself. You're on some sort of journey and we get a ramp up. So this comes from mammal studies and I can't say how much this generalizes to humans yet. Uh, so this is one that's um, in transition. Now, a lot of these studies actually do come originally from mammal studies and there's just a flood of new science that's now applying it to humans. So here we have things like streaks. So once you hold someone towards a goal, we can keep them on that uh, dopamine rise. Um, if you're giving out something with shipping, uh, what you can do is play up that time to the reward because it's very, you know, it's a time to play with the fanfare, to drum things up, to make much ado about the shipping. And I think MailChimp did a wonderful thing. So they used a random reward. They gave me a random t-shirt and then they played it up. Um, and I've never been to the Web of Change conference, but it's always in some remote location. It's sort of web technology uh, meets existential personal fulfillment. Uh, <laughs> and the journey is supposed to be wonderful. So the last thing is disappointment. <laughs> okay, 
sorry. I, 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 this and the last one, and I'm done. So um, if, we, if we deceive people and promise that we're going to give them something and we don't deliver on it, there's actually a dip in activity. So uh, there is an outcome to uh, clickbait. Uh, so, so normally, um, these things cause long-term damage. And so use expectation management. These, these are some examples that Michael um, and me used in our training with Conversion Excel. Uh, but tell people what's going to happen next and be straightforward and plain speaking and always tell the truth and deliver on your promises and you'll have dopamine that's uh, well deserved. So um, just a quick summary. <laughs> it's all on here if you need it in the slides, but we're just going through the points. So, Michael. And that's actually our number one question of them all. <laughs> What's in the box? <laughs> okay, so let, let's, let's try it quickly. Let's have a look at you first now. Okay, and then we go, who wants the box? There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you should give us. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a gift to boost your dopamine levels. Okay. I don't know if I need a boost. Oh, <laughs> it's, gonna, okay. it's going. It's going way up. Oh, nice. Yes. More drink tickets. Drink tickets. Drink tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are like cigarettes in the prison yard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's worth a lot. Trade them for services. <laughs> okay. Let's. Uh, so we answered that question. What's in the box? It was interesting because this one was trending before. Ah. Uh, Can you answer that quickly? <laughs> Uh, probably Golden Retriever. Golden yeah, Retriever, awesome. Think. Okay. Uh, let's do a quick one. Uh, or let's just take that one. What works best for dopamine uh, long term? A mystery gift, not knowing it's inside, or a surprise gift that you didn't know you would receive at all? Oh, yeah. Uh, delivering on all your promises, having something of quality, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and satisfying your customers. Awesome. Like, that's. We had more questions, but Brian is going to be around, so please talk to him tonight. And actually, we, I don't know why the lights came on. We didn't do that as a tactic to get you to round off, but it worked. Yes. So, <laughs> so maybe we'll do that again. Yeah. Thanks so much, yeah, man. This is awesome. Thanks. Oh, you have to take it. Uh